a huge welcome to joining us for this um, conference. It's my job as director of the School of Education to ensure that um, we have the opportunity to, to make sure that everybody's welcome, but also to say thank you um, in advance for the contributions. Putting a conference programme together like this, as we will know, is a, is a challenge. Um, there are exciting things about it, though, because being online means that we can have um, a bigger audience and a wider audience and the opportunity to work with people from across um, the, the country and to get op opportunity and input from beyond that as well. But I would like to say a particular thank you to Lizana and Tracy and Sean and the team for pulling together the very packed agenda that we have. In terms of our um, work across inclusion and diversity, one of the things that I think is important is we can sometimes think that it's other people's business, that it's their concern. And actually, what I hope we will hear throughout this week, that it's everybody's business and everybody's concern. And in the School of Education, our um, motto that we have for our trainees is to be informed, to be inspiring and to be influential. That's our ambition for excellence. And in terms of the work around inclusion and diversity, I think it comes, becomes even more crucial and comes even more to the fore. And so as we start the week um, in doing this welcome, one of the things that I would like you to have in your mind is the question, what does this mean for me, is my first question. And sometimes when you hear different people speak throughout the week, um, it might be that actually it, it's not what they say is not at the top of your agenda. But then when the second question is, but what would this mean to others? And what does that mean to other people? And most importantly, how can I make a difference? Because what this conference is ultimately about is all of us as education professionals making a difference to that agenda, to that work, that ongoing work around inclusion and diversity to make a difference in education. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the different speakers that we have. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Alison's got to say uh, as our keynote. Um, but I hope as well, above all, that we'll have the opportunity to then think about the role that we've all got to play in influencing change within education. Um, at that point I'm going to say I hope um, that you have a wonderful evening tonight and I look forward to hearing more and uh, participating throughout the week and I'll hand back to Lizana. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome and a very detailed summary of um, what we are hoping to achieve with the conference and without further ado i'm going to hand back over to alison then professor alison peacock to then lead on the opening keynote for us for this event um alison over to you i will be looking after your slides for you so if you could just let me know when you would like me to move it on then i shall make sure that happens thank you very much lizana and um thank you very much everybody for attending this evening. I'm looking forward to hearing the leadership presentations. No pressure. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking about inclusive leadership this evening. Um, if I can have the next slide, please, Lizana. I think that everything that we do in school should be about connection. It should be about being as inclusive as we possibly can be. And it should be about leading with kindness and compassion. My goodness, if ever we needed it, um, we need it now. I thought, I thought previously that um, we'd been tested by the pandemic. And now the images that we see on our screens 
are just so horrific, aren't they? They just um, remind us so much about why conflict is such a, a terrible thing. Um, and, you know, going forward, we will need to be welcoming and wanting to welcome youngsters into our schools. We've previously welcomed youngsters from Syria, from Afghanistan. I suspect we will be welcoming youngsters from Ukraine, youngsters who will have experienced goodness knows what trauma. So that notion of, of being an inclusive leader is about including and connecting with all of our children, all of our staff, as many of our families and parents as we possibly can, all our governors, you know, that, that notion of gathering together is central to being an inclusive leader. Thinking about that notion of inclusion, when I was very early on in my career, I had the opportunity of working with a child who was severely disabled. She couldn't um, speak, she had verbal dyspraxia. She was in a wheelchair, she was in year two. And I was asked by my daughter's head teacher, I was taking a career break at the time, I was studying at Cambridge and um, I was on the playground going to collect my daughter from school and my daughter's head teacher came out onto the playground and she said to me, oh, Mrs. Peacock, you're a teacher, aren't you? And I sort of said, mm, yes. And she said, oh, well, we've got Claudia and um, we need her to learn to read. She's in year two, she hasn't learned to read yet. And we'd like her to, uh, we'd like you to come and teach her for three hours a week. We don't want to waste any money on an advert. We thought we'd ask you, would you be interested in, in coming and working with Claudia? And I remember feeling quite, scared actually of working with Claudia. I was worried about how was I going to be able to communicate with her? She couldn't speak. How was I going to be able to teach her to read? I wasn't going to be able to use sort of the traditional method. She wasn't going to be able to say back the words to me. Um, and then I was also worried, well, she was in a wheelchair and maybe was she fragile and was there a chance I was gonna break her? You know, there were, there were all kinds of worries about working with this little girl until I met her. And then as soon as I met her, I realized that here was this, seven-year-old who was absolutely full of boundless energy and enthusiasm and joy for life and it was just shone out of her and she had a huge grin with no front teeth because she was seven um she could communicate by letting you know if she agreed with you but she goes, <laughs> yeah. she'd let you know if she didn't like something more and if she wanted to ask why she'd make a sign for why like this she could so she could she could communicate she had an absolute love of of, of life really and she had a teaching assistant called Maria who uh, was Spanish speaking Maria as a teaching assistant wasn't allowed in the staff room in this school at this time so we had a child who was um, isolated with a teaching assistant who was isolated from the main staff group and I set about thinking well how can I teach Claudia to read now Maria knew how to sign so Maria was teaching Claudia sign language I didn't know how to sign, so I was learning the signing, Claudia was learning the words in the book, between us, all of us were teaching each other, and then we would go down the corridor together, Claudia in her wheelchair, Maria one side, me the other side, great big corridor, all the classrooms had windows looking out onto the corridor, and right at the end of the corridor were all the reading books, and so we would go down there, and then she would choose the next book, and then we would come back, and we'd be laughing and joking, and as, as she became more confident because she'd got her own teacher and because she was being noticed and she was going to learn to read. She um, gained more friends and on the playground she would go out and she'd be in her wheelchair and children would come skipping up to her and they might say, Claudia, it's not fair. And she might say, why? And they would tell her something that was happening and she would listen really intently. She would laugh with them. She would be sad with them. She would empathize. She was kind of the best coach you could have really, the kind of person you just want when you're being coached don't you You don't want someone to tell you oh yes you've reminded me of this you just want them to listen and genuinely really listen and she would do that and then essentially the problems would solve themselves and the children would skip away happy and then it'd be another day when she next went to Great Ormond Street she came back with a frame without her wheelchair and so we would go down the corridor to choose her next book her with a frame Maria one side me the other side until the day came when she just sort of signed she didn't want her frame and she stood up and on her own and she didn't use the frame and she took a step and then she took another step on her own and the children in the year two classroom looked up and saw he was their friend Claudia and she was walking without a frame without a wheelchair and they just burst into a round of applause 
And we came out of the door of the classroom. And as we came out of the classroom, we came along to the other classroom and the children looked out and they could hear the applause from next door and what was happening. And there was their friend, Claudia. And she was walking on her own and they, here she is. They burst into applause and till the whole school was applauding Claudia. That was a huge, huge moment in my memory. And I must have told that story thousands of times. And yet it really symbolizes to me the power of an inclusive environment where we don't label children. Nobody had labeled Claudia. Nobody could actually predetermine what she was capable of doing. So therefore, why wouldn't she learn to read? And this is her at her secondary school. Um, so that notion of keeping the door open for all children, allowing children to surprise us is at the heart of being an inclusive teacher. It's at the heart of being an inclusive leader. If we take a look at the next slide, please. These were books that I was involved in writing with colleagues from the University of Cambridge. And they're all about an ethos, learning without limits, that says that we shouldn't set a limit on any child or adult in terms of what they may do next. If you can create a culture within your school or group of schools where no limits are set, then you've got a culture where anything can happen. And that's an amazing place to be, where people genuinely believe that anything can happen, then amazing things do start to happen. So that first book, The Red Book, was published um, with colleagues from the university, teachers from up and down the country, both primary and secondary, nine of us, our classrooms were studied for that book. The middle book is the story of when I was a head teacher and how I took a school where I was um, head teacher from special measures to outstanding and then for it becoming a teaching school. And then the third book is about assessment. If we're going to assess children and we're not going to label them, we're not going to group them by so-called ability, how are we going to do this? Well, essentially we work with the children so that they can constantly be challenged in their learning. And we don't have to throw everything away to do that. We just organize the classroom in a way that we would do as if we were giving different groups extension tasks. And we say to the children, here are the tasks. This is the level of difficulty. Start where you think you are most likely to be able to be successful. And if you can do that task and you can fly through it, then take on the next one. Or similarly, if you start a task and it's a bit more tricky than you thought it was going to be, there's no issue with revisiting. So that the children genuinely become partners in the learning. And I talk about in the book, if you've got 30 children and one teacher, then you should have 31 assessors in the classroom because everybody is assessing their learning as they go. Everybody is improving on their, on their learning. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Lizana. So essentially, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do you shift the culture to one of learning without limits where fixed thinking is not, the, not what you're focusing on. You don't want to be in a situation where everybody says, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it. It's, you know, nothing changes. Those kids, that estate, what do you expect? You want to be in a place where anything feels possible. So that notion of moving from fixed thinking to transformability is at the heart of a learning without limits culture. If we can take the next slide, please. Thank you. So post the pandemic, I'm kind of hoping it's post the pandemic because I can't cope with anything else. In terms of the news, what with cli climate change, uh, you know, uh, the virus, war, it just feels so, so awful at the moment. Uh, but in a situation where things feel bad, schools are needed more than ever, and they're needed to be places where, where there's a listening opportunity, where children can talk, actually, frankly, where staff can talk, where we can share our anxieties and we can make each other feel better where we can really appreciate everything that gives us a glimmer of hope, if we can find one, um, and really fostering a sense of belonging and shared identity. These are really important. So even if it's only the fact that today when I walked down the garden, there were daffodils emerging, it's finding the things to give us a small amount of joy is, is so fundamental. If we can have the next slide, thank you. I think when I joined teaching, and I hope the same is true when you joined teaching, I did it because I wanted to make a difference. I'm still here because I want to make a difference. I lead the Chartered College of Teaching because I want to make a difference to all children. And I know that sounds like a really grand aim, but it is what gets me out of bed every morning. It is this idea that 
the more that we can enable our teachers to be informed and connected and celebrated, the more we can enable our children to flourish. And I think the pandemic taught us that our core purposes and values matter more than ever. So making sure that we value every child, everybody's contribution oh, is absolutely at the heart. And that's not right. focusing... It's better for me. Sorry, can we go on to mute, please? Not focusing on a catch-up narrative, but a, a narrative that's about how do we find a way through for every child? How do we enable them to be re-inspired? How do we enable them to have a collective appreciation of learning? So finding a way through is my kind of mantra, really, about what can we do in difficult situations, whether it's with adults or children, government policies, whatever it might be. How do we find a way through? How do we find a way around it to do the best that we can for our children and for our communities? How can we enable that to happen? We can move on to the next slide. Thank you. There is a really important part of this, which is about well-being for you, for your colleagues. Uh, and something that happens to leaders is that people come and tell you their problems. So in an inclusive, diverse school, you will want to be enabling so much, but also in order for you to enable, people will need to support you. So that reciprocity is going to be really important for you because you will hold the anxiety of others. If parents come and tell you problems, they tell you about things they're worried about with their children. If staff tell you about things they're worried about, if you have nowhere to put that, no one else to talk to, then that's you just absorb all of that anxiety. So being able to find some, whether it's a, a coach, whether it's a confidential mentor, whether it's your husband who perhaps has nothing to do with teaching and is just someone that you can offload to, whoever it may be, you will need that because in other areas of social services, there would be supervision. We don't have supervision as head teachers, so we need to create a space to be able to make sure that we're not absorbing everybody's anxiety. If we can have the next slide, please. So uh, an inclusive curriculum is really vital and making sure that all areas of learning, every aspect of the curriculum is celebrated because there will be children who will only really shine when it comes to being on the football pitch or there will be children who only really shine when they become in an art studio or a drama studio or they're offered the opportunity to dance or to give a talk or you know any number of things. We need to make sure that the curriculum doesn't just privilege the academic and it doesn't just privilege writing, reading, mathematics. Of course it matters, of course it matters that every child is given the best chance to shine in those subjects, but we need to give them the opportunity to show us that they're not defined by how good they are at reading, they're defined by who they are as a person and that's fundamental. I can have the next slide please, Lasana. Thank you. In terms of appreciating diversity, the Chartered College is just, um, we're launching a new online web-based course, which um, colleagues can, um, it's free for members and they can do at their own pace. It's all about um, decolonizing and diversifying the curriculum. And we hope very much that this is something that colleagues will find of great interest. There are links to videos, there are links to case studies. It takes you through a series of, um, uh, developing ideas about the notion of decolonization, the, noti the notion of diversification right through to how to enact this within subjects. And I think this is something that is hugely needed across our school system. It's not about being woke, it's about listening and understanding the needs of your community. It's about valuing individuals, it's about valuing heritage languages, it's about thinking about cultural capital, not just from the position of the white middle class person. Thank you. If we can move on to the next slide. It's also something about how do we make sure that we offer equity and empathy throughout our school. There's a guinea pig on this slide because um, at one point we had a child who joined the school where I was head teacher who had been excluded from other schools. He was in year five, he was very angry. He'd been adopted, lots of trauma in his background. And um, the teacher that he was working with was a, a great big rugby playing six foot teacher who came to see me at the end of the day and said, I can't cope. 
I can't cope with this particular child who's just been incredibly rude to me. He's said all the things that probably other children have been thinking for years, but I've never said. I'm not sure how I'm going to carry on teaching him. And that night I went home and I worried about it and thought about it. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to advertise for a superhero. And so I came into school the next day and I put an advert in the staff bulletin for a superhero to come and work with a lad to ensure that he could have a happy final two years of his primary school and the teacher who came forward was a lady called Rasheen. She um, said that her two children had two boys. She would have liked to have thought that if they'd had an advert like that in their primary school for a superhero to come and help them maybe they would have stayed in primary school and wouldn't have been moved to special education um, and that she would like to come and work with us um, which she did. And she later on qualified as, ther as a therapeutic support teacher with the Tavistock Centre. But what she did most immediately when she arrived was she talked to David and she listened to him and she heard him talking about the fact that his foster mum was uh, breeding guinea pigs and he was passionate about these guinea pigs. And so she came to me and said, let's get some guinea pigs for the school and let's give David the responsibility for caring for them. And this is exactly what happened. So at the lunchtime, David was caring for the guinea pigs and he would allow appointments for children to come and meet with the guinea pigs and pet the guinea pigs and stroke them and so on. And this was far better than cruising around the playground, terrorizing the lunchtime play staff and so on. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the uh, solution for everything. So, I mean, don't rush out and buy a guinea pig tomorrow, but it was, it was, indicative of a mindset that was about how do we find a way through to help this child? What are the things that we might do that can help him develop a different identity to the one that he is developing, which is one of being quite violent and someone that people are frightened of? How, what's the opposite of that? Someone who's caring for creatures. And yeah, so it's just an example of, of thinking differently. If we can have the next slide, please. So the Chartered College of Teaching is a professional body that seeks to enable teachers to work in a research informed way to provide the best possible education for all our children, which is why I'm, I'm really interested to hear about the presentations this evening. I think the more that our profession is inspired and enabled to be um, knowledgeable and to share their knowledge, the more likely it is that we can all do the best job possible. I can have the next slide. We have a set of journals, um, which you, you see here. And if we move on to the next slide, we're also offering the opportunity for teachers to study to become chartered. So regardless of the MPQs that you're studying for, the opportunity to then seek accreditation beyond that um, is available. It's all available online for you to do different modules. And you might say, oh my goodness, doing an MPQ has finished me off. Well, maybe have a little rest. But to seek ultimate accreditation as a leader or as a teacher through the chartered route is something that I'm hoping we can pull together across the whole country so that teachers are really given the recognition, the status that they deserve. We can move on to the next slide. Thank you. This, I think, I believe, will make a difference in terms of managing accountability demands. We move on to the next slide. I think it will help our the future opportunities of our profession to be further appreciated. We'll have greater global connection. Chartered status will be a global status. And as I said, I think it will help us to feel more confident, but also to be able to gain greater recognition. I do believe that we need to think about assessment and how we make that more inclusive and, and there are various commissions running at the moment and I can talk about those when we come to have a discussion in a moment and also there's something about how do we create a more beautiful peaceful world after everything we learned when the world stopped for a while during the pandemic if I can have the next slide please so just in case you're not already a member <laughs> please join us um, it doesn't have to break the bank and um, from trainee kind of free membership through to early career membership at one pound 88 it, it, you know um, it's only 47 pound 50 uh, annually to become a member of the chartered college so um, just a final slide and that is to um, say that Maya Angelou talked about the fact that at our best we are all teachers we genuinely make the difference 
And I don't know whether you know the story of Maya Angelou, but when she was a little girl, um, she was uh, she was raped, unfortunately. And this was such a shock that she stopped speaking. And it was her teacher, Bertha Flowers, who ultimately persuaded her that she needed to start speaking again when she was um, a young teenager. And this was because she said, your poetry is so beautiful, Maya, but poetry is no good unless it's spoken. So Maya Angelou always said that she believed that teachers change the world, change children's lives. So if we can finish the slides, I'm sorry I've gone two minutes over. Well, if we finish the slides now, Lizana, thank you. And then we've got time for some questions um, and discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, I was trying to let people in as they arrive as well during your talk. And we have loads of colleagues now joining us. And I was wondering if anyone might want to ask Alison a question about either inclusive leadership or the Chartered College of Teaching. I know how much it changed my, my life in terms of my my, my research, the work I do, and how I also look into all the various journals and, and aspects of the Charter College of Teaching, and also how you can get involved. So it's a really exciting um, new uh, Charter College that, that really helps us to develop as professionals and practitioners, and it gives us that professional status we want. Um, so anyone have a question? <laughs> People are often shy. <laughs> Any I mean, questions from colleagues? I might not have any. <laughs> no, I'll just keep talking at you. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a conversation, absolutely. Any questions? <laughs> I can't see any questions in the chat either. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Um, I'm really enjoying this presentation so far. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I used to work in education. I no longer work in education, but I'm considering returning to education. So. Raw. Yeah, <laughs> um, but, but from a different perspective, okay. um, cu currently doing my diploma, national diploma level three in counselling skills with a view to continuing to become a qualified counsellor. Right. Um, I can see that there's a lot of need for mental health support for children and young people. And just wondering if, you know, I'm not a qualified teacher what would be the best route to get back into that if this is something that you can respond to? I don't know if this is relevant to you. So um, in terms of providing counselling support, then um, obviously you'll, you'll need to um, finish your diploma and then um, make sure that you've got someone to provide you with supervision because schools that employ counsellors need to make sure that they're doing that in a way that um, enables that professional response. Um, in terms of supporting young people with mental health, we are um, planning a whole series of webinars which will be with CAMS workers at the Charter College. These will be free for members. And they're all about how to, um, in the classroom, how to respond to children who may be suffering from eating disorders or sleep deprivation or anxiety. You know, very often teachers feel that they don't have the skills quite rightly because they're not mental health professionals, they're teachers when it comes down to it, but they do have a responsibility through um, the new curriculum to actually make sure that those kinds of areas are covered. And we would far rather that they were covered with skill and sensitivity than, I mean, you can imagine the worst case scenario would be um, the teacher who is given a tutor group and told, well, you've got to do something about anxiety this morning. So they give out a worksheet and <laughs> almost, almost make things worse. So this is about how do we make sure that colleagues have the opportunity to really develop their skills. And I think certainly when I was a head teacher, we had an art therapist who came and worked with our youngsters and she had supervision so that she would meet with some of our children, either in small groups or individually we would never actually know the, the outcome of those conversations other than it would be a referral service that we would offer within school. And it just meant that it was, it, it didn't mean that I had to be solving everything as head teacher. It didn't mean that our teachers had to be solving everything. It was another route when you're waiting for a CAMS referral because CAMS can take 
up to two years for a referral for a young person. So the kinds of things you're looking to develop will be very much in demand, it strikes me, in school, as long as schools can afford to pay for it. That's, that's the sticking point, because money is always a problem. Thank you. Yes, I would initially want to offer it a pro bono initially, because I, I can see that the need is is increasing and it was already bad before, but I, th I think it's, it's definitely exacerbated over the last couple of years. Well, one in six children is is um, the, the stat. One in six children uh, is uh, thought to be a child that is suffering from mental health and anxiety. So the need is huge. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody else? Or observations or just thoughts? Hi, yeah, I can't hi. see anyone else. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Um, really enjoying what we spoke about so far. I think it hits to the heart of, of a lot of us. We're all hopefully of the same mindset. Um, I wasn't aware of the chartered um, teaching. Hell yes. surprise! I wasn't <laughs> even aware of it. So I'm going to put my hands up and I might be asking a question that everybody knows. But unfortunately, if you don't ask these questions, you don't know. No, Obviously, right. we've done our MPQ qualification. Is this the chartered? Is that a further qualification on top? Right, so the Chartered College is an organisation that you, that you can join that gives you access to a massive research database. It gives you a journal four times a year, lots and lots of um, free membership um, benefits like the mental health course I was just talking about, and, and it's £47 a year to join. So you don't have to be studying to be a Chartered teacher to join the Chartered College. But what we're really interested in doing is giving teachers the opportunity to build upon their professional learning and to gain a, a, a further accreditation that means that they can then have letters after their name to say that they are chartered. And we believe that, that whether you're doing a master's degree, a PhD, an MPQ of some form, that actually to bring a kind of sense of coherence to the system, regardless of the school that you're from, would be to actually I hate to say it, but further study to become chartered. So, and you know, there are written examinations. It's not easy, but on the other hand, the people that have done it, and there are over a thousand people now who've gone through the process. They're saying that they really value it because it means that they've got genuine recognition for something that they've really had to work for. So, I would encourage you to have a look um, and and see the the first module or the first module that we encourage is the evidence informed practice module. And this is a module that takes you through online learning. It's £99 for the module. It takes you through the process of how do you engage in an evidence-informed study? What are the main areas of study that are out there? How do you, how do you know whether um, something is um, worth further looking at? So developing criticality and so on. And then should you wish, there's an assessment that you can do at the end of it. But I would encourage you to join us. I'm sorry I laughed because I'm only laughing out of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think there's a lot of work that's been done, Alison, um, to make people aware of the Charter College, but they, obviously we, we know we have to do a lot more work as, as fellows as well to, to, um, ad, to be advocates for the, the Charter College, but I can vouch for you know, the, the interesting challenge, um, all the different courses presented because I was a mentor on one of the Charter courses and um, my mentees um, enjoyed it thoroughly because they had an opportunity to really network and also connect with people, but also engage with research and then think carefully about their practice and work with me as a mentor as well. So there's lots of opportunities. You can also be a reviewer for the um, Impact Journal or you can write your own journal articles. There's a really fabulous opportunity to work with like-minded colleagues. Thank you. What a, what a great advocate you are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm very passionate about the Charter College, as you know, and I've been part of it from its first inaugural um, conference. So um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from yourself and your team, and it's a really great opportunity to have you here. But yeah. thank you so much for joining us today, Alison. We really appreciate it because I know how busy you are. And um, 
I am sure that um, colleagues will have more questions and if they have any, please email me and I can pass it on to Alison and we can make sure to learn more about the college as we work our way through things. But thank you so much for today. And um, it's unfortunately all we have time for in terms of the um, opening keynote, but I'm going to then move across then to talk to our MPQ colleagues. Um, today is also about the celebration of the MPQ submissions and colleagues MPQ journeys. And the first speaker we have is Laura Haidt. And Laura, I just want to check, do you want me to make you a co-host so that you can share your slides or are you hoping to just speak as you are? Uh, yes, if, if you could make me a co-host so I could share my slide. Okay. Great, thank you. You were there right at the top <laughs> and then disappeared. So yeah. let me just see where you are and then I'll make you co-host. Thank you. I'm a novice on Zoom. <laughs> I have no lossy. There you go. I found you again. Okay, so it's over to you. You are now a co-host and you will be able to share your slides. Can you see that okay? Somebody let me know if they can see. Yes, we can. You can, perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so my name's Laura Hyatt, it says on the screen. I'm deputy head at Woodland School, which is a special school in Coles Hill for pupils aged four to 19. And we have um, in Warwickshire, we're called a broad spectrum school or a generic school. So we have the full range from those pupils with real complex medical um, profound learning difficulties right through to those with more moderate needs um, we've got 216 pupils on roll currently and I started my MPQH in May 2020 um, and finished it approximately a year later so it was right at the start of the peak really of the first wave of the Covid pandemic and as well as the school data and what I was seeing anecdotally, evidence was starting to come in from other areas about the impact of the pandemic and the disproportionate impact on young people with special educational needs and disabilities. So the focus for my project was to use a social and emotional development programme to improve well-being, um, increase the knowledge and understanding of staff, and also to enable further academic progress for the pupils. Um, obviously, we're aware that from Maslow that our pupils are unlikely to learn if they're very dysregulated. So that was the focus for, for the project. And let me take you on to the next slide. So the Thrive approach is, um, some of you might be familiar with it already, it's, um, it's recommended through the DfE uh, Mental Health and well Wellbeing Guidance, and it's a tool where you can um, have an online tool to assess a whole class of pupils, specifically in terms of social and emotional development. Now, what I really liked about it is how it's evidence-based and it's based on neuroscience, um, you know, how the brain works in um, different stages of uh, crisis regulation and what we can do to help further the pupils' social and emotional development through that. So it's got a lot of play work in there, a lot of understanding about pace. And the tool enables a class to be assessed as a whole, but then it gives you feedback on partly how you should be with that pupil, so what they need from you um, develop in terms of their development, and also some activities to do with the pupils to support them uh, with their social and emotional development. So some of the information that was coming through, as well as my school data, so my school data at that time showed that there were double the number of safeguarding incidents compared to the same time the previous year. So we were seeing an impact on behaviour and lived experience for pupils. But also um, I looked at the Anna Freud Emerging Evidence series because globally some countries had been experiencing COVID for longer than we had and um, were reporting on the impact that was happening. Um, which when you look at some of the things listed here um, that children were experiencing sometimes double the levels of stress, anxiety and depression. Um, pupils schools were closed um, many schools were closed not special schools because all of our pupils 
a cluster is vulnerable. So we still had a, a large cohort of pupils in, but some of our pupils were away from the support settings that they that we provide for them. Also, when you consider pupils um, with an EHCP, um, we were acutely aware that we had pupils in school that have an EHCP that lists a huge range of um, holistic therapies, hydrotherapy, rebound therapy, and so on. And some of these pupils were living in a tower block with siblings who were being home educated, and we were really concerned for people's well-being. So our priority was on um, well-being, um, maintaining relationships to enable these pupils to transition back to school. And we wanted to really increase the skill set of the staff working with these pupils. So these are some of the things that informed how I was going to um, initiate this, this plan. So the main model that I followed was John Cotter's eight step change model, and that formed the basis of my action plan later down the line. Um, and it sort of fed into me with the, with Simon's next find your why in within the special school, it was really clear why we were doing this and why this was necessary. Everybody was affected by the pandemic and everybody could see um, the devastating impact it was having on some of our pupils. Um, and Michael Fullan's uh, Leading in a Culture of Change was also rewritten during 2020. And some of the things that he included, um, talking about leaders needing to be contextually literate and leaders finding themselves and being prepared to become an apprentice at times of cultural and contextual shifts, which all seemed really relevant. So these were um, Cotter's book, along with these two books, were some that I found really helpful. So the data that was being um, projected about the impact also suggested what could undo and reverse some of these um, challenges that pupils were facing and um, some of the some of the language that was being used the potential for mass trauma which you know is not something that I thought that we were going to be facing so I mean I looked when putting the action plan together on how we were going to uh, move this program forwards I looked at various um, documents. So the International Successful School Principalship Project, um, which really supported that the thing that made a successful school principal is those that attend to the broad moral, social and ethical issues in education, not just the academic. Um, and the Sutton Trust 2011 report on improving the impact of teachers on pupil achievement really showed that having a very effective teacher helps pupils to make more progress more than anything else. Um, so what we wanted to do at a time when classes were operating in bubbles and we weren't able to move around in the same way that we would previously is ensure that for our pupils who were in school, which was most of them, that every adult who supported them um, was doing so in a way that was informed in um, well-being, child development, neuroscience, so that they were consistently having a response that was going to be helpful in, in their development. So part of the action plan, which I'll come on to next, related to um, CPD for all of the staff in the school because we weren't able to move around we needed everybody to be an expert in supporting social and emotional development for our pupils so the, the reason that we chose the thrive approach ahead of any others is because it's appropriate for um, people at any stage of child development um, so we have pupils who are operating cognitively at very early stages and the um, five approaches is, is as helpful for them as some of our pupils with very moderate needs that we expect to go on to employment. So I put together the plan in advance and I linked it to Cotter's um, eight steps, which actually I found really helpful. And it's a model that I've now employed with any change um, that I put in place in school, any school initiatives that I'm putting in place. I now follow this same model. So stage one about creating the urgency um, 
involve presenting to the whole staff to help share some of the data, our school data, other schools, um, national data, and so on, and then moving on to forming a powerful coalition. So this format I now use for, um, I'm, I'm also the senior mental health lead, so I've got a mental health action plan, which again follows, follows this model. So a couple of the um, transformations of leadership that I looked at. So I looked at the Harvard Business Review, seven transformations of leadership and the sort of strategist approach alongside Goldman's, um, Goldman's six leadership styles, which I, I felt like a blend of coaching and visionary was really what was needed in this style because we needed staff to be brought along. And um, a way of doing that um, sort of coaching them through it and be, being on message was in how we communicated the need for change. So we started off by communicating um, the urgency of this. So we used a communication strategy that was as face to face as we could do. So it was over video messaging. Now that was necessary because it was a wise use of time because people were able to um, engage with the message, the, the message, I was able to ignite their passion with, you know, rhetoric and body language and, and facial expressions to help get the buy-in from them at that time. But we also struggled at this time with knowing how much people were engaging with us. So I don't know whether you found this in training that you're doing in your settings, but a lot of the time it needs to be other people's cameras off because the bandwidth doesn't allow for it. So it's hard to know how much people are engaging. So we put all sorts of things in place to try to increase the communication. So um, systems that were happening anyway, we added Thrive into it. So there was a weekly feature on senior leadership team meetings um, so that it was discussed. Um, and that the senior leadership team had training in the Thrive approach to form part of the, uh, the guiding coalition, as, as Cotter would call it. We had um, a weekly briefing where there would be a one minute Thrive tip, which might be about the, uh, vital relational functions. It might have been about using pace with pupils. It might have been a, um, getting a, a play therapy strategy um, um, sent across to staff. Uh, followed up by an email with resources. And again, it's hard to know how much people are engaging with that. Uh, posters, such as the ones on, on the right, sent around to classes on display. We would email out things such as the um, nice visuals from NeuroChild, which really link in with the, the messages that we were trying to send. Um, but all of those things, it was really difficult to know how much people were buying in because of the nature of the bubbles. Um, and doing all of our, our communicating with staff via video messaging. So in addition, we um, had regular surveys, so using Microsoft Forms to text, text out surveys to check staff's knowledge and understanding and confidence in the areas that we were training them in, in the use of social and emotional development. Um, we also wanted to increase the accountability, so we were hoping that everybody would come along and, and follow this Thrive programme because they wanted to and they understood the value of it. But just to make sure that that was the case, we incorporated it into um, areas of school life, such as um, our school development plan, um, performance management. Everybody had a performance management target around it. Our CPD schedule had half-termly training on something that was connected to Thrive or social and emotional learning. We um, Ordinarily, we have uh, a two-week deep dive into a particular area. So we did that based on uh, Thrive and ordinarily, it would be um, us going into classrooms and observing and doing book scrutinies. But because um, this was a time when we weren't moving around the classrooms, um, we asked classes to send us videos. So it might be about how they meet and greet their pupils warmly in the morning and welcome them into the classroom. It might be um, a display um, about regulation, understanding your feelings and so on. Um, and we also included it as an area on our pupil progress uh, data collection. So where we would always be getting termly information about progress in English, maths and so on, we added a thrive in um, so that it was it was staying on everybody's radar. 
and linked it in with things such as EHCP targets, PEP meetings. Um, the document you can see on the top right of the screen is another example. So we use um, something called a positive intervention plan here, which is a way of um, having a consistent approach where a pupil's got a behaviour that causes challenge to others. So um, we included some information about Thrive, about recognising what developmentally where the pupil was at and what's developmentally appropriate to support them. So we really found that we to try to ensure total engagement with this model that it was incorporated into all existing school systems it was regularly shared by um, email um, and in, in school briefings and that the staff were being exposed to it re regularly the data the surveys that we did showed us that term on term the staff gained in knowledge understanding and confidence in using it um, and this is just an example, um, an anonymised example of how we shared the information with, with staff. So within Thrive, there were different strands that are uh, related to different parts of brain development in, um, in children. So we would send them out and show the classes these quick wins, again, which is part of Cotter's system, so that they could see how, how what they were doing was positively impacting the pupils. And um, all of the pupils made... Um, progress in Thrive, significant progress in Thrive, and those who made significant progress in Thrive, also um, this correlated with their academic progress and also with their attendance in school. So we noticed a real link between all of those areas. So the, we're, we're, we're still going, so Thrive is still going. The, we spent a year really embedding it in school and it's really part of the language and part of the, the school systems now. Um, we still do the regular surveys and the latest survey tells us that only three out of the 130 staff haven't fully got it yet, aren't fully on board with it, um, but we're still, we're still working on it. Our, CPD and performance management is ongoing to remedy this. So, for example, I've got some educational psychologists coming in to do some more trauma and attachment awareness. A real impact for me, I've, I've before had, um, I've tried to implement changes, new initiatives, and they've fallen flat on their faces, and I've not really been sure why. And it's felt like a bit of a luxury, although it didn't always feel like a luxury, uh, to read up on some of these leadership of change models. And Cotter's model has now formed the basis for any sort of change that I'm, that I'm implementing in school. Similarly, um, the impact of forming a guiding coalition and having that as a key part of any change initiative has really helped. So some of the staff, um, I've referred to three out of 130. In November, it was seven out of 130 and I've sent three of those staff on attachment based mentoring courses and now it's um, it's reduced the number of staff who, who don't get the message so we've been able to link the CBPD in there. A key um, factor for me of it, the success of the project was linking it strategically to the processes that were happening anyway so this hasn't added to anyone's workload and we checked this through the staff surveys that this wasn't adding to anyone's workload. So anything that happened um, was a system that was happening anyway. So pupil progress happens anyway, performance management happens anyway, deep dives happen anyway. We just made Thrive the focus of it. And it seems to have really impacted staff's awareness of evidence-based approaches. Um, and when we've had um, school improvement partner visits, which we've had one today, the areas that Thrive feeds, in, Thrive feeds into, such as behaviour and attitudes and personal development, are now judged to be outstanding. We just need Ofsted to come and uh, agree with that. Um, and, our, and our school has a really good reputation for excellent pastoral care. So there are some references here in case they are of help to any, anybody. These are some of the things that I've referred to, but I didn't know if anybody had any questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Laura. Any questions from colleagues? We, we have time for one or two questions. It's a really fascinating uh, project, and it's really interesting to hear how you've used Cotter's changed theory to, to help you move things forward. I think we don't seem to have any questions from the chat. I've had a quick look. 
Anyone else want to ask a quick question? I think you've clearly blown them away, Laura. <laughs> no problem. Thank, thank you for taking the time to listen. No problem. Thank you so much for all your hard work. And it's wonderful to hear how much work you've put into it and what your outcomes were and the impact on the children. Thank you so much for being brave to share it today. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're going to move on then to introduce Faye Edwards. And Faye is going to then tell us a little bit more about her MPQ leadership journey. Faye engaged in the MPQ SL. So Faye, um, I'm going to make you co-host. Okay. And you'll be able to, to share your slides if you like. Over to you. Right. Hopefully this will work. Right. Can you see my screens? Uh, not at the moment. Ooh, OK. Um, my apologies. I, too, am quite a novice to this. Um, so if you click on the green button, it says share screen. So you click yeah. on that oh, and then okay. click on your PowerPoint. There you go. There we go. Right. No, no, yes, now we are there. Great. Right. OK. So can, can everybody see that OK? Yes, I think we're fine. Oh, fantastic. OK. Right. OK. So I um, this is the first part of the leadership um, journey that I've undertaken. I'm the phase leader for three or three and four at the moment. And I undertook my MPQSL um, last year. Um, so the project that I was leading was to do with pupil variation and delivering the implementation and um, strategies in line with the National Tutoring Programme. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of the National Tutoring Programme, of course, I'm sure most of you are because it, it, it's such a big thing um, in relation to COVID now. Um, it's, um, a it's a set of funding fundamentally to reduce variations in attainment between people pupil premium children and those affected by the school closures and their peers so it sat very nicely for me with my focus for reading and maths okay now we I focused on reading and maths because mainly it was part of our um, school development plan our, our school development plan specifically targeted the attainment gap we've very much got a historical um, responsibility to reduce that attainment gap which I'll go into very shortly um, the focus was also very much on pupil premium children and the rationale behind this was because at that time our pupil premium children accounted for 32 percent of the children within our school now that has gone up significantly now um, and there are strategies in place based on what we started um, last year in relation to this the data that i looked at and the rationale that i formed was and looking at the research, especially from the EEF, suggests that pupil premium children have that consistency of actually not achieving um, the same progress in attainment as compared to the general cohort that we have. Taking on board, um, as our previous speaker did and our keynote speaker did, about the impact of COVID and the impact that that has actually had on our children as a whole in relation to wellbeing, but specifically for the purposes of my project in relation to the children who are eligible for pupil premium and those who are not, but still have the same kind of constraints on their academic learning. Um, something that I found really interesting was that it was between seven, uh, sorry, 11% and 75% is what the gap has widened with. Now that research was ongoing, but the EF suggested that it was around 36% um, that has reversed the progress that the schools have made so far. So when we actually look at the work we have been doing for our pupil premium children and the responsibility that we've got to reduce that, the COVID pandemic has actually increased that. So we, we have to target our interventions into the wellbeing and into um, the children who have suffered most as a result of this. I used, um, as, as we all did, the data to establish what my cohort would be and what my, the pupils that would be involved in this. And I used three or four ways to analyse this. So I got a broad and balanced um, account of children. So I looked at our whole school data for years one to six. Now our whole school data worked on the fact of um, an average point score. Um, so it was an internal based assessment 
tool that we used. That made it actually quite easy for me to have a snapshot of where the children were um, because it was split into obviously our girls and boys, our free school meals, our, our greater depth. So there's a real good snapshot there that all the teachers put into. However, I didn't feel that was enough. I didn't feel that was wide enough. That was just our school. So I looked further on at our stats. OK, and over the last three years, um, the percentage of children achieving the combined had been variable, so it did change. However, in all of the years, the percentages of the disadvantaged students had been less than the general cohort, and it wasn't just less, that gap was actually widening. So it was very clear when we looked at the data that there needed to be something in place for this. I then took it a step out and looked at um, the local cluster. Now, within our local cluster, um, we are in a, a pocket of depravity where we are, um, but we were very much average. OK, um, and we were in line with surrounding schools, um, but only 38 percent of our pupil premium children were reaching the expected standards. And that made us actually one of the lowest. Um, and then I looked at the wider contributory factors. I took this into account and I used the research from Hearst in 2007 is because we had to take into account not just the data that we have, but also the effect that the pandemic was having on us. And if we look at the research there, um, the research there was saying that, yes, there needs to be um, the provision within schools. However, the external factors are important and need to be taken into consideration as, as well. And the external factors that we have at the moment with COVID were something that was unprecedented, wasn't it, that we hadn't had before. So I looked at this data, I identified that there needed to be a way forward and within the provisions of um, the project, it was a case of, well, what do I do now? I've identified that it was reading and it was maths. There were other MPQSL projects within the school as well, looking at SEN and looking at the writing. So I was trying to find something that would fit everything and benefit our children as well. Um, I identified a way forward by obviously speaking to all partners. I did pupil voice. I spoke with parents. I spoke with um, senior leaders. I spoke with staff. I spoke with the children about what they felt they needed. And this was part of the communication plan that I stuck to throughout the whole entirety of the project in relation to involving others and empowering others to get everybody on board and moving forward together. There were three options I could do. OK, we looked at um, Lexia. I'll run through them very quickly in case you haven't heard of them before, because they are absolutely amazing. So Lexia is a reading application. It's a computer led reading program. Um, it's specifically there to close the reading gap and it's a structured program. So the children will sit in initial baseline. They've all got headphones on and then the system will work through um, a series of baseline tests with them to work out where they are. So it will give you a reading age. It fits very much in line with um, the reading curriculum as it stands at the moment, um, looking at all different areas from phonics all the way through to comprehension. So it can be used to bridge a pupil premium gap or it could be used to push your greater depth children. OK, and the beauty of this one is it is so user friendly for the children and for the teacher. It can be used as an individual intervention. It can be used in the classroom. It can be used um, to support learning within the classroom, whole class or individually. So that was the one strand. The other strand was math, which we looked at um, third space, which is a math tuition. Again, very similar to Lexia, but it's math based. The main difference is the third space is an actual tutor rather than a computer led program. OK, um, and it's um, it's a one on one based on a baseline. And the third one was action tutoring, which was a reading intervention. And again, very similar to third space. It does a baseline and it's a one to one intervention. So Lexia is a computer led um, generated and the other two are interventions with a person. So I explored all of these and to get a holistic view of the child and a holistic view of our pupil premium capacity under the funding of a national tutoring provision. I didn't know which one to choose. So I decided to implement all three under the umbrella of the National Tutoring Project um, in order to reduce pupil premium, the gap between pupil premium and their peers, with the caveat of including those who are most affected by the COVID pandemic, because I know we have a lot of children um, who haven't applied for the free school meal status or their parents have not applied or they are not pupil premium on file, um, but we know they have the same barriers to learning and the same barriers that they need to overcome. So I decided to do all three. And then we had lockdown. So I got all of this set up 
and then we went into our, our next lockdown. So we went, it was remote learning. With a lot of collaboration, with a lot of joint working with all partners, that be our tuition partners, it was our teaching partners, it was our parents and our children. When I look through the theories of change, which I will just very quickly go through in a minute, we managed to get every single one of those interventions completed remotely. So every child that was involved in this project, even if they weren't at school as a key worker, were able to get their um, interventions delivered remotely. That included um, sending hardware home, it included sorting out broadband, it included a lot of ICT work, but I was really proud of our teaching staff that they managed to get that in such a time of crisis for these children to have that constant and to have that intervention at home. So the theories of change was probably the, the biggest area for me um, to think about because of, of how big the change was at the time. So I've just quickly broke down there the areas that I looked at, the Lewin's change models, McKinsey's, Cotter's theory of change and the Kubler-Ross all had real positive areas for me. And if I'm perfectly honest, I probably dipped into each one, um, took a little bit from each one, but the one I decided to focus on really was the framework for leadership. Because at this time we had to acknowledge that change was confusing, it was difficult. The whole education system was going through change and there was us going, well, can we do these interventions and can we do this? And it was very quickly realised that it wasn't just enough to be a charismatic leader, which full and outlines. It needed to be more than that. It was structured, a commitment. It was the building of relationships and a moral purpose. All of that needed to be in place. It, people couldn't just be pulled along on this. It needed to be built and it needed to be done as a team. So I found that in Fulham's framework, there was a moral purpose. And I think every teacher in this, throughout this pandemic, has felt that moral purpose to the children, to the well-being, and to trying to bridge any lost learning. And it was about understanding the changes that we were going to do. Now, we didn't have to do too many managerial changes, as, as the previous speakers have said, because a lot of things were already in place. We were just adding on to this. We were just making it better. We were just offering further um, interventions. The main part of the success of this project was being able to implement that change through the relationships we had and building on the existing relationships, building on the existing knowledge base that we had and building on the experiences that we had so far. Um, in relation to the management strategies working alongside the change, um, theories of change, um, again, it had to link very closely to our trained strategy. So we, I looked at all the pupil premium strategies. Because the interventions that were being provided were part of the National Tutoring Project um, provision, the EFF completed a lot of very, very useful um, strategies and implementation guides, which I was able to literally take and use and use effectively as it was that reactive and research-based approach to the pandemic. So the, I found that some of the management strategies were very current and moving with the times to implement it for the children. I obviously looked at um, Goldman theories and looked at the visionary and coaching methods and the supportive and participating, um, and very quickly decided that the pace setting and directive um, settings weren't necessary where we were in this in our leadership journey because the school was already working together and as I said it was about enhancing what we already had rather than um, unfreezing and changing and changing our practices we were just building on what we had already okay so the main problem that I had with moving excuse me the main problem that I had with moving this forward, as, as other speakers have said, were the restrictions that came through the pandemic. OK, um, and it was keeping that balance with what the right what we needed to do for the children, but also what we needed to do for our teachers and our well-being. Um, there's a lot of um, research out at the moment, like um, the well-being charter and um, the different um, research base that's come through in relation to well-being for the staff and teacher retention so it was very very much a balancing act um, but again driven by that moral drive and that need to support the children I, I got very little resistance there but what I did do was try and make sure that all the strategies were necessary and weren't increasing teacher workload or teacher burnout communication was key 
with all the partners to be able to provide everything remotely and then have a seamless return to school with the interventions in place. And that was simply through regular communications with parents, regular communication with partners and regular communication with the teachers. Now, the parents were very much on board, as were the partners. And again, it was with the teachers. I just needed to be careful that I wasn't overloading teachers. So I made sure that the data and everything that was sent to them was clear it was concise and it was necessary if it wasn't necessary i didn't send it okay but the teachers very clear knew that if they needed anything all they needed to do was come and i'd have that information there for them um, i shared it weekly with the staff so that they could see the impact that they were having it empowered them it gave them the tools to teach um, within the classroom and to do the interventions and to use what was provided with the in interventions and because they were so involved in implementing it it empowered them staff were coming to me and going oh this said was look what look look what this child has done or look what this child has done and they were able to speak confidently and lead into other existing practices like our pupil progress meetings um, like our teacher voice like our pupil voice um, like our deep dives it, it supported the existing processes rather than making something new and from the feedback that i had from teachers at the completion of the project that was one of the biggest things that came out. Well, it was quite intensive to get it started. However, it then benefited us, benefited the students and wasn't actually a massive amount of work afterwards. Now, for the other part of the, the other side of our project it was in relation to the training. So the interventions were established and they were running, but I needed to make sure that one, the teachers understood how to work the interventions and how to support them but i wanted to make the training deeper than that so i created a schedule of half termly training that was to be done whenever suited time was given within the day because of the lockdown and it included how to use the interventions in a wider classroom provision so that it actually impacted on teacher and learning provision as well i looked deeper into it for the pupil premium learner so there was a package of training um, sessions in relation to how pupil premium children work. So I tried to go through both lines of the academic side and also the teaching and learning side as well, so that the whole project included intervention strategies, training and understanding. Um, I think I've already gone through quite a lot of this, so I'll very quickly skim through it. OK, we had to the implementation was the hard part because of because of the lockdown. OK, but with a fantastic staff body who were empowered, included and had took on board the project, the logistical needs were sorted out within the first few weeks. Clear communication meant that everybody was involved in every step of the way forward from the start of this project to the end of it. OK. Um, the communication, although not great, was through emails and, and Zoom, which two years ago, we'd probably say wasn't wasn't the best way to do it. But because of staff wellbeing, again, in the teacher voice, having that freedom to do it at the time that they needed to, at the time that suited them, actually helped them to manage their own workload. OK, and one of the key, key things that I found was actually identifying existing talent to create that collaborative approach to empower other members. So this project wasn't all driven by me. I identified certain pockets of talent that could help out and deliver the training as well so that it was shared between us. OK, the outcomes were all very positive. OK, so at the completion of this project, which finished in September, um, sorry, June, ready for June, July time, all groups apart from year two, they had been really affected by the remote learning attendance. Um, you can see the information there, but in, in a nutshell, they've all made um, over the expected attainment. Now, within our data, sometimes they would all make progress, but the gap would widen for these children. Okay, whereas looking at the data that we had, um, in all but year two, that gap didn't widen. They were still below their peers, but they had kept up with them in relation to their attainment. So I could also use data from the interventions. So within the data, I had to create a whole new data system just for the children that I had in the project. So in all but three classes, the percentage of children who were working below the year group 
expectation had decreased. In fact, four classes had progressed to working above their year group and it was closed in the attainment gap within the intervention. One class actually evidenced an increase of 7%. Um, and in the three classes that evidence that there was no progress attainment maintained, there were external circumstances um, that may have impacted on this. And this was things like um, attendance, safeguarding and um, absence from school. In relation to maths, year five was the most successful cohort and, cohort, and again, all of the groups within um, maths had made progress from the interventions. Um, again, a bit more information on year two. This was a year group that didn't make as much progress as all of the other year groups that were involved. Um, and again, there were external circumstances um, that account for this. So overall, all the year groups that were involved in the interventions um, made progress and were able to, I was able to evidence that with the data. As it happens, um, I am the intervention lead again next year, well, this current year, sorry, and all interventions that were in place have carried on into next year due to the success and the data that we had to show that it reduced the pupil variation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Faye. What a really fascinating and insightful journey. Um, as you were speaking, it reminded me also of, of Fulen's new book, which is called Nuance. And it sounds to me like you had to have a really nuanced approach to this change leadership project that you had to move forward. Thank you. So shall we ask for any questions? Anyone have a question for Faye? We, we don't have a lot of time, but we can fit in one or two. Seems like you've been sorry. Thank you so much. One more. <laughs> okay. Colleen. Um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Of course. Um, I want to congratulate her for doing this during the pandemic because I had to do the same thing in my school and I know how difficult it was to get it up and going. We use Lexia as well. And mm -hmm. we're a secondary school and we had to use it with a lot of our students who were arriving from other countries without having gone to school or really low reading ages. So I really want to applaud her for the structured way in which she did this and the impact that was clearly visible in what she did. We also used bedrock learning for the mid, the mid ability students who were impacted by the pandemic and we got a national award. I know how much work she had to put into this. So congratulations and just keep it going because if for students, literacy is the doorway to so many opportunities in life. Yeah. And if we don't open and keep those doors open, then we're doing a disservice to another generation. So well done. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kali, for, for those encouraging words. And I could not agree more. Thank you, Faye. Well done. And congratulations on that wonderful project. Our next speaker then is Adrian Lee. And Adrian also participated in the MPQSL. Adrian, I shall make you co-host to enable you. you then to share your journey with us as well. Okay. You are in front of me and then you disappear. <laughs> It's always the way, isn't it, with Zoom? Okay, here we go. I found you. And you are now co-host. Okay, right. I I'll try my very best. Is that screen showing? Not quite. Um, quite. I think if you just click on the green button. Yeah. And then select your presentation. It should come up in a minute. Anything now? If not. <laughs> no. No, not quite. Uh, it's been one second. Okay, share. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my project was based around um academic language and, and vocabulary. What um my context, I'm a director of English at a large secondary school in Warsaw, and um we're finding that. Our students come to us in year seven um, average and they leave average. The data from 2019 was that a P8 or progress eight score was minus 0 0.01, which is average. 
which is fine until you look at the PP score and we look at that our PP students generally when they leave us are way below uh, national average and in 2019 it was at minus 0 0.39 so way below um, averages in terms of uh, local averages and national averages um, and then looking at the year sevens that came to us when I started this project in 2019 when I started this in September 2019 26% of our students who came in were, were PP so we see that there is a correlation between why our students come to us um, average, but then our PP students aren't making the, the, the same amount of progress. Um, and then I, what we also do, we do our uh, reading tests at the start of, of the year through um, Accelerated Reader. And when we did our testing in, the, in the September of 2019, we saw that 25% of our year sevens had a reading age of below um, the age of 10. So it got me thinking really, I mean, as a head of English, I'm always asked to try and sort out the issues when it comes to year 11, particularly with reading and writing and how the, these gaps are growing as time goes on. And doing the MPQ uh, SL gave me an opportunity to think about it. What about starting earlier? As, a, as an English faculty, we, we take on a quite a brunt of the expectations of improving literacy across the school. And that, I, I can't say that's our colleagues' fault. I think it's probably down to um, a lack of confidence and, and, and obviously training in that. And we've tried a lot of different types of uh, literacy strategies in order to get other subjects on board. But we have a lot of different things going on in our school. We have bedrock vocabulary, we have Accelerated Reader, we've done Words of the Week and, and all different types of literacy um, techniques which haven't stuck. Um, so it got me thinking really about the data in front of me is showing it's quite stark, that the gaps open up quite early and we're not really closing them um, by the time they, that they leave our school. So um, I thought that's something I really wanted to work on really. And I came across the Oxford um, reading project or reading report, sorry, of 2020. And it just basically said COVID was going to cause much bigger gaps in reading and in particular vocabulary. And it made me think about trying to join the dots really between the reading programmes we have, but also trying to get other faculties involved in the responsibility and as you can see there, Jeff Barton talks about how teachers, all teachers have a wide responsibility to teach vocabulary. So we've tried it many, many times, but I thought that has to be the why, that has to be the reason um, I'm gonna go forward with this to try and really sell this again. And not looking just at reading, but particularly vocabulary. And that was my starting point really, trying to look at tier two words or those words that are those academic language and trying to improve that. Um, so that was the starting point of my project. It was about trying to make sure that literacy and being disciplinary literate, particularly about across all subjects, was important. And getting our students from year seven to see the links between the vocabulary they use across all subjects. And through that, being able to close, close those reading gaps that may well have opened uh, to, because of COVID-19, bearing in mind, yes, uh, year seven would have been the cohort most affected. So I, that was my way forward. That's one to, to take a look at really. Um, so I went in a way forward. I looked at the um, EEF uh, toolkit and looked at ways of, of, of doing it. Initially, my idea was to do oracy um, using talk as the way of shaping, um, you know, better vocabulary and, and, and then reading. Covid hit, unfortunately, so that kind of scuppered that um, idea. So I moved on to this idea of bridging the vocabulary gap through um, using what I'm going to show you in a bit. So in terms of the, the theory I looked at, like everyone else has said, um, Cotter, Lewin, um, Kubler-Ross, I decided to look at uh, Cotter because I like the idea of the flexibility and the, able, the ability to change, well, to create a sense of urgency, 
but then uh, to be able to be flexible, but also to empower others. And I think for me, that was the most important thing. I wanted to keep the responsibility away from just English being the preserve of literacy, but everybody having that, um, that input really. Okay, so how did I share it? It's difficult because I'm, I'm a head of English and therefore I have 13 people who um, I manage and it's easy to suppose to push things down, but uh, what this project has, has taught me is having to, you know, to work up as well as down as well. So what I decided was to just launch it at our uh, monthly faculty leaders um, meeting with SLT and my colleagues about really that their, their feelings around um, literacy and vocabulary and their com and how comfortable they were. And that engendered a really, really interesting conversation because what we found out were there were common words that were coming out, particularly at Key Stage 4, that uh, were common across different um, examples or, or, or different subjects, but had slightly different meanings. And um, yeah, here we go. So it's showing the idea of the, the different kind of academic language, words like emerge, classify. So we had this, this discussion about what kind of words are common across um, our subjects and what do they actually mean? After talking to our the faculty leaders, um, I asked them to go away and to compile a list. So I was trying to get a kind of collaborative approach really in terms of it's not just the preserve of the English department. What we're trying to do is everybody is involved. Everybody has these common issues. What can we do alongside that? So we came up with these, these words and we saw there was a lot of commonality between um, the kind of words, the problematic uh, tier two exam com command words that particularly students who are PP, might well not understand. And if you could pick those up early on, it would give us more of a, a fighting chance going forward. So we, we talked a bit about that and we came up with this idea of then these common words, which you can see in bold there. Um, so that was a starting point. But I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I knew that I needed a lot of help, particularly with the subject specific areas of that. So using the research that we looked at I, I i looked at goldman's six styles and i believe the word was early adopters and i might be the wrong theorist if apologies if it is but this idea of getting people on board and i asked for faculty leaders to identify people within their subjects who have an, a passion or an interest in this to come and work with me now half of this was done over lockdown so it was a lot of the work was done through email um so not a lot of face-to-face -face, which had its own issues obviously it was um you couldn't have a lot of meetings they were quite restricted so i had to make sure whatever i was doing was clear was concise um and it was easily easy to be followed so um yeah it started off online and then we returned to school in march and then we, we met in teams in terms of then trying to um get this forward and we came up then I came up with really this idea and it's based on what I read from Alex Quigley who um, if, if you've been an English teacher you'll know not about him and he wrote a book called uh, Closing the Vocabulary Gap and this is what's called a Freya model and the, I thought to myself I need something that is cheap I think really part of the project is something that's value for money but also could be used in different contexts whether in school or online. And working with the early adopters, it was really a case of what are those words? We know which words are similar that we have in, in common, but how are they defined? How are they talked about in maths and science and so forth? So when we came back into school, I had a meeting with the early adopters and basically following Goldman's uh, six styles, I, I, I took on what's called a commanding style to start with. I just thought it was easier for me to, as an English teacher, to do much of the, the more difficult work. What I didn't want to do is intimidate others in terms of, you can see the word etymology there. So what I did was I produced um, the slides to start off with. 
this is one of the things I showed at a uh, CPD about how the word source has different meanings uh, to different subjects, but they have a common etymology, they have a common um, word base that actually, if you understand the word base, you probably understand what that word means in your subjects. So I decided to take on a commanding style, start off with, with first, by actually leading them through, and then, uh, I've got to back a minute, leading them through what I wanted them to do, okay? Once I worked with the early adopters a lot more and they're more confident, it was a case of them, them taking those slides. I kept, I did the etymology bit. I made sure that that was, um, was just consistent. And that's what they wanted, um, wanted me to do that bit. But then they could, uh, they could put on their definitions and characteristics and facts that related to their subject. So when we returned to school in March, and actually didn't, this didn't actually start until the summer term because of bubbles and all, and all kinds of things. But when we went back to normal teaching, the expectation was these words were shown every week and every lesson, and there was a different word every week. And really it was for staff to talk through what those words mean in their subject, but highlighting the common etymology really. So there's not a fear in what these words mean. They can see commonalities in them. And if they see that word in French or, or food or, or geography, they'll be able to understand, oh yeah, I've seen that word before. It kind of means that, so it must mean this in, in this subject. So that was the idea really behind it. Try and get this confidence in trying to close this vocabulary gap knowing that these types of words are words that are used later on in GCSE. So I came up with a bunch of words, so it's an example of one for explain, explain being a very common exam word at GCSE, but also words that might be used in, in key stage three as well. So this is an example from, I believe, geography. Um, so as I said, the blank slide was there, but the definition, characteristics and examples were related to their particular subjects. And that was basically just hammered every week, every lesson, every week in all classes. Well, I say all classes, not all classes, because some uh, some subjects like maths and science were probably not as um, into it as, 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 as others, um, probably more literacy-based uh, subjects, but it was hammered out uh, a lot in that summer term. So, I moved from a commanding um, leadership style to then democratic by allowing the, um, the early, early doctors to take ownership of those slides. And then I moved into a coaching leadership style. I'm here to support, I'm here to help, I'm here to share ideas and so forth. So I, I found myself learning myself through this, this, this process of how to adapt as a leader. And I really found that very, very useful being used to having to say work up and work down uh, as well. So in terms of outcomes, we, as I said, we've got different types of, um, of, of, of ways of, of doing literacy at our school. We've got Bedrock and we've got um, Accelerated Reader. It, it was mostly done the summer term, so it didn't have a full year, but correlation, in terms of outcomes, through bedrock, there was a 12% increase from PP students in their understanding of tier, 12, uh, tier two words. So we started this in the summer, summer one, by the time we'd done the test in summer two, there was a 12% increase. So there's a correlation in how extending these words out constantly embedded it in their minds, they were able to then understand what those words meant and were able to um, pass those tests for bedrock. And again, in terms of correlation with the, the reading outcomes, I said that at the start, yeah, yeah, some PP students were averaging around about the reading age of 10 years. Um, that moved to about 11.5 uh, years in, in reading age. So again, I saw progress in that and it was a short amount of time because of COVID, but it was really promising to see that students making this connection between what these words mean and being able to make, um, you know, understand their, their fundamentals and making links 
there was a start. So the deputy teacher has said, we're gonna continue this this year. And we started this year and we didn't review year eight as well. So the current year sevens are continuing with it, but we're also bringing in the new year sevens in as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this moves forward. But um, I, I, I've really been proud of this and it's something we want to try and sustain because as I said, we've had a, quite a lot of these types of projects before and they haven't really stuck. And I'm hoping this is something that can stick really uh, for the long term. But um, yeah, that's really my, my project um, and moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Adrian. What a wonderful project. Um, as an English, English teacher myself, I'm really excited about this and would love to hear how it's moving forward in future as well. Um, if I could just invite colleagues, we have one minute for possible questions. If anyone has a question, that's a good opportunity to ask Adrian before we move on to Rachel. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, uh, Dame Alison Peacock wrote, great to see the impact of this um, work, Adrian. So some lovely comments in the chat as well. So well done. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you all are. Um, and it's been lovely to hear about it from you in person, Adrian. Um, and we are looking forward to hearing more about this project. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker then, we are going to move on to Rachel Tranter. Rachel, I'm hoping you're still in the room. Um, I did manage to let you in. And um, hello, Rachel. Welcome. Um, I will make your co-host in a minute. I'm just trying to find you on the list. And there you are. Um, yeah, you've just named yourself Rachel. Let's just double checking. And over to you, Rachel. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me just find my PowerPoint for you. Uh, are you able to see that? Yes, then? we are. Perfect. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, uh, my name's uh, Rachel Tranter. A um, bit of sort of context about me. Um, I'm an assistant principal um, at Joseph Leckie Academy in Warsaw. Um, the last couple of years have been quite uh, challenging for myself and for my school um, and lots of things have changed uh, fairly drastically which um, included sort of what I did for my project. Um, I came to senior leadership through sort of the curriculum route uh, in that I was a head of department um, and then my senior leader roles have all been um, something to do with managing of teaching and learning. So the project that I completed, it, um, the name that I sort of went with was the developing uh, the use and effectiveness of online and virtual teaching during COVID-19 to improve student progress and close the gap between mislearning and contact time. Um, so it was quite a substantial project um, because it was taking on um, the whole of the school's online curriculum and how we delivered teaching through the lockdown. Um, it wasn't what I intended to do at the beginning. Um, I wanted to do some work on staff professional development. Fortunately, I have done that since we've come back to school, which is good. Um, but we had quite a large change during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially at the beginning, because sadly we lost our head teacher to COVID-19. Um, so there was quite a lot of change that happened very quickly. Um, and in a way, I almost had the project uh, thrust upon me, um, if it were, um, because of my role changing during the pandemic. So, what my project was, um, was that I identified a problem with student engagement with remote learning. I, I took over a role in the leadership team in May of 2020. Um, so right in the middle of the first lockdown. 
um, I started to look at teaching and learning and the engagement of students with lessons that were online and the work that was being sent. Um, at the time, obviously, as you know, we went into lockdown very quickly. Um, there was a lack of available online resources um, that were used by the academy um, alongside about 25% of our students who were receiving work via the post um, because of the school being in quite a deprived area and because of the huge number of students that didn't have access to technology um, or if they did, didn't have access to uh, the internet which caused a problem and that then did mean that very quickly for us our students were not receiving the teaching that they would have done if they were in the academy. Um, additionally what I did find uh, was that when I took a sample of lessons that were there they were quite dry and mechanical um, and so it was clear that we needed to do something quite quickly uh, to address the learning that students were receiving to try and encourage engagement with home learning as best as was possible. Um, so the first thing that I did was that I put in place engagement trackers for staff to complete from home where staff were able to indicate where students had or had not completed work and if they had to what extent they'd done it. So was it to the bare minimum or had they gone, gone above and beyond? Um, when I sampled a selection of core and EBAC subjects, I found that in years seven to eight, uh, people premium students rarely reached up to 50% of engagement and some dropped below 20%, uh, which obviously was quite poor. Um, the non-people premium students had a slightly higher average, uh, which indicated um, the remote learning provision at the time was in, um, insufficient of what we were providing. Um, Alongside low engagement, staff had commented that the work that was being submitted to the students that were doing their work was often poor um, or of poor quality. And that then impacted staff morale and staff were not feeling great about this work that they were doing from home for then students to not be completing it anyway. So I worked with the rest of the senior leadership team at school and developed a whole school um, policy for um, remote learning. Um, so I wrote the schools, uh, the academy's remote learning policy um, to implement how we should actually be uh, teaching our children from home. That was introducing software support alongside training to introduce a new method of teaching. Um, I tried to do that through creating a base of familiarity before asking staff to fully adopt remote teaching by making use of programmes that we already had. So, for example, we are a Microsoft 365 school, so it just made sense to use Microsoft Teams rather than Google Classroom um, because staff were already aware of it and were therefore more comfortable. Um, so the policy that we agreed on in the end was trying to look at how for our school, can we best teach them from home? Lots of schools, um, which at several points I was very jealous of, <laughs> had the luxury of being able to do all live lessons. Um, unfortunately for us, that was never going to happen because of the lack of access that our children have to technology. Um, there may well have been a laptop and some Wi-Fi in the home, but when they're sharing that between eight siblings, there's no way they're going to be able to log on and watch all of their lessons. So we had to come up with a more um, diverse approach. So in the end, our policy included that staff had to deliver teaching through a variety of methods, which included um, some live lessons via Teams, some lessons that were pre-recorded using Microsoft Stream. Lots of the practical subjects went with that approach. Um, we ended up with our technology department having created a recording of them using every single tool um, and piece of equipment that they had. The art department filmed all of their different um, uh, methods of um, producing pieces of art, uh, which was really good because then students were able to watch their lessons at different times of the day and pause them and come back to them if they'd needed other siblings to use their laptop at home. Um, so it, it worked in the sense that it was more appropriate for our students and we did start to see uh, an engagement. So for my project when I thought about and looked at the sort of the change management styles um, because as I said my job role changed and my project was sort of 
<laughs> throwing at me a little bit. Um, it did mean that I didn't necessarily think about the change management strategies before, but instead uh, sort of went with the flow and then reflected on what it was that had happened after it had started. Um, one thing that I did find was interesting was that I sort of thought what we saw staff go through was similar to stages of grief um, for our school. I mean, we particularly did go through stages of grief because of losing members of staff. Um, but also we lost what our teaching role used to be. And so people went through stages of grief for the fact that their job changed so significantly. So that was something that I found really interesting. Um, I did start with Fulham's uh, framework for leadership during change. Um, it's that if only because, as you know, it's it's the change model that is based in educational theory um, and therefore it keeps the moral purpose of education and the fact that the students should be at the heart of all things that we do in school. Uh, to me, that just um, felt the most appropriate uh, for a project in a school. I then saw that staff started to show signs of being on sort of the Kubler-Ross curve um, to the point that during the original pandemic of the academic year um, in 2019 and 20, that they were showing sort of denial and frustration towards the change. Um, because, I mean, as you'll all know, as teachers, I like to teach in a classroom of students rather than on a computer. And so it was frustrating and, and people didn't seem to really want to admit that it had changed so much. Um, I then realised that at various points I was following Cotter's theory of communication, uh, where the vision was shared and then continuously reinforced with the whole school, focusing on how the project would affect both staff and students. Um, in one of the uh, books that I read, uh, books book of uh, Leadership Matters, uh, I read that removing obstacles can empower the people you need to execute the vision and it can help the change move forward. So while we were in those phases of sort of denial and frustration, I had to work with senior leaders and middle leaders to make sure that we were developing a remote learning policy that was easiest for our staff. We find that having this um, hybrid approach of live lessons, but also pre-recorded lessons and then work uploaded to SharePoint was also providing comfort to our teachers who were working from home at the same time as homeschooling their own children. And it meant that they were able to fit that around their um, home learning sort of schedule. And that moved us into Kubler-Ross's sort of stage of acceptance and integration. And we knew that COVID wasn't going to go away by after the Easter holidays, which I'm sure everybody thought it first would. And, and we did manage to integrate this remote learning provision. And then we ended up having come sort of full circle to Fulham's model. And we've got to like this institutionalised phase where all staff were following common practice um, and it was routinely praised and celebrated through support with staff morale. Um, I created a sort of standard version of what good online lessons looked like and shared that with staff. And we were then able to share um, good practice through CPD. When I thought about what my leadership styles were, I'd say it varied from the start to the end of the project and varied who it was that I was working with. Um, so in the beginning, started a little bit of a visionary in that um, I was appointed onto a team where there was this that was created that just simply didn't exist before. And I needed to make sure that it was put out to staff in the, wrong, in the right way to make sure that they were on board. Um, I also then used the democratic leadership style when I was working alongside um, other groups within the academy, like the IT team and our manager of our online platform. Um, knowing that they're the ones with the expertise and not me. And so I needed to work with them as part of a team rather than stating what it was that I wanted and not being flexible. And that led me into a much more coaching style of management, uh, which is something that I've kept as my role has continued to change. So when I think about evaluating the impacts that the project had through 
a sort of standard process of tracking to see if students were meeting their targets. So I updated the engagement trackers that they used, uh, that all staff used um, for staff to regularly input who was completing work and where. Uh, we used Microsoft Forms to create online assessments so that we could continue to assess and track students from home and then made the use of baseline assessments when we returned to face-to-face -face teaching. All of that was tracked via Sims mark sheets and then Excel data tracking sheets, which were monitored by all middle and senior leaders. So that then um, targeted phone calls um, and safe and well checks uh, could be sent out via text if necessary. Um, the teaching online we monitored through remote drop-ins, heads of departments um, periodically dropped into um, lessons of members of their staff um, and gave feedback and we were then able to use particularly good elements that we saw to help support other people and that was sort of a part of a peer review process of sharing that good practice. Um, Stringer et al stated that success will be determined by the quality of pedagogy and the way in which it's implemented. So even though we changed fundamentally how we do our jobs, it is still boils down to what is good teaching and learning and how can you engage children uh, in learning. And that's the same whether they're at home or whether they're at school. And we needed to make sure that the work they were being provided with was appropriate um, by the end of the second lockdown, it meant I was able to compare uh, the results um, of engagement from one to the other. Um, and with the, I did a comparison of attainment as well, particularly in English and maths. Um, in English and maths, there was an increase of attainment after returning on their baseline data um, from 69% to 75%. Um, from the first lockdown to the second. And then overall, by the end of the lockdown, we found that we had 87% of the academy engaging in teams lessons, which is the children. Um, and that was because we were able to allocate over 350 laptops to people premium families with the use of uh, dongles and original, original, uh, additional um, internet access that we provided to some families. Um, so the, the impact of the project that I had in terms of my leadership journey was sort of a combination of implementing an academy-wide change, which changed fundamentally what it was to us to be a teacher, whilst also trying to keep morale high uh, during a really, really difficult time. Um, what it showed me more than anything was the real difference between leadership and management um, because of the organisation that it took and the delegation that it needed. Uh, was quite a steep learning curve, particularly for me, of sort of the idea that you can't always be the one that does everything and that you have to work within a team and use the strengths at your disposal to implement real change. So in particular, what I learned through um, the project and through the whole course of the MPQ really was that being a leader with integrity and someone who's transparent in their leadership is really significant. I learned how to work with staff in a way that means that I've now gained a different level of trust with staff compared to what I did have before um, and that staff have seen that I was able to implement a change and that now staff still come to speak to me about new ideas that they have got um, and how we could move forward with those and that's thanks to the implementation of the project. I really enjoyed doing the MPQ um, and Mostly what I enjoyed actually in the end was the research aspect because of the vast amount of reading that we did. And that's a massive form of CPD. And I think that we can always ensure that the change we're implementing is going to be a positive one if it's based on sound research. And like Fulham proposed that we've always got the students at heart and it's for them. Um, so yeah, that's that was me, that's my project. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you for that detailed outline. It sounds like if I listen to every single one of these presentations, it's our COVID story, isn't it? The leadership story in schools and how you had to think really carefully how to impact positively on children's outcomes, but also then mitigating the pandemic in, in many ways. So um, is there anything you want to add to that? Is that how it felt to you in terms of your the COVID journey as well? 
Yeah, the it, it changed entirely what I feel like my job was. Um, and I think that's the goal changed completely. And now how, what we noticed in particular with our children was that it changed how they act in their lessons at school because they've come back and the vast majority of them now are just so incredibly grateful to be in a classroom, which I think if you'd asked them a couple of years ago, do you want a year off school? Um, they would have thought it would have been great. But now that we're back and they're back in classrooms and, and can do group work and, and can speak to their friends about their work, they're, they're very appreciative, which I think is then really, really good for staff morale having came back after such a difficult time. Lovely. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you for sharing that wonderful leadership journey with us. Now, I can still see um, uh, Professor Dame, uh, Dame Professor Alison Peacock in the in the room. So, Alison, I was wondering if you want to say anything about all these wonderful presentations. Any thoughts from you? I might have put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to move. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, no, I think the presentations have been amazing and it's just been great to see the impact of the study and all of the candidates have talked about their engagement with research, they've shown how that's made a difference to the decisions they've taken within their school and they've been able to reflect. I think it's been a fabulous evening and congratulations to everyone who's contributed. Thank you very Absolutely. much. I think it's just wonderful to see what schools do and actually hear about those really um, actual stories and, and what they had to think about in terms of the, the pandemic and the challenges they faced and how resourceful they had to be. Absolutely. Well done. Well done, everybody. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I can also see Sean Starr, Dr. Sean Starr in the in the in the in the room. Uh, Sean, do you want to say something as the person who originally led on the MPQs at the university before I picked it up? Well, <laughs> I might be wrong putting you as well, but I just thought it'd be <laughs> lovely to hear from you. Oh, that's very kind, uh, Lizana. And um, yeah, I just think listening to the stories today have just been inspirational and I'm really pleased that I was at least part of the program at some point and I'm very happy that you've taken over and driving it forward even further. So no, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow now that I'm hosting. <laughs> Fantastic, yes, absolutely. And that's also why I pulled you into the conversation. Um, so just to, as a plenary then, um, first of all, thank all our speakers in particular, also um, Dame Professor Alison Peacock, for giving up her precious time to talk to us about the Charter College of Teaching and also inclusive leadership. Um, thank you to all the participants for your wonderful contributions. It, it inspires us all to hear what you've done. And then tomorrow we have got Sean um, hosting for us. And we also have Dr. Matt Silver, who is the CEO of Pathways. And it's a special school um, uh, or special, special schools academy or SND academy that he leads. And he's also going to talk to us about his leadership journey and inclusive practice. And then of course, many wonderful talks in regards to colleagues' leadership journeys on the MPQs. So we're really looking forward to tomorrow and we would like to invite you to join us again tomorrow. And I shall send through an update on the program um, because we have two changes, one colleague's um, mother is unwell and someone else needs to swap over. So I'll let you know about those as well. Um, Sean, anything you want to add? No, not for me. I hope everybody has a real pleasant evening and um, I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>